All right, I'll open us in a word of prayer and we'll begin. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to reflect again on what it means to make your name great, to tell of your mercies, uh, to exclaim uh, to the world that needs to hear the gospel, uh, the truth of a Savior who came to forgive sins and to justify the ungodly and to make us your own. Lord, we thank you that we have the privilege of being here, of being on this earth, of having breath from you, of having heard and believed the gospel for those who have. And then with that, the stewardship, the responsibility of testifying of your goodness in our lives. Uh, We are eager to be trophies of your grace, eager to be those who uh, herald the good news. And God, would you be pleased to use us as means to your great end of making a people for your own possession? And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to pick up where we left off last week, and it was fascinating. Uh, a number of conversations I had this week with people who said, oh, I've got a, another way that I like to do evangelism. I gave you a list of, of just potential ways to make a regular habit of sharing the gospel. But I love some of the suggestions that came my way this week. Uh, one of them was just go read your Bible in public. Go to a coffee shop, take your Bible with you, open it up, and read it. And you'll be surprised how many people will come and stop and ask you questions. Hey, what are you reading? Why are you reading it? Uh, That is a a wonderful way. It it works with a paper copy. It doesn't work so much with a phone. If you're reading your phone Bible in public, people think you're scrolling drivel. But uh, if you've got a paper Bible and take it to a coffee shop, that's a great way to begin conversations. I really love uh, the idea of making disciples the old-fashioned way, right? That's having children and uh, having a captive audience. And I'll never forget, I was doing inner city after school tutoring in math and, and had, a, had a kid named Alan Town, Townsend. And it broke my heart. Alan, every week, would come and, and meet with me for tutoring, and he wouldn't look at me, he wouldn't talk to me. It was difficult to get through a math assignment It was extremely challenging. Uh, It it, it frankly was um, not particularly enjoyable to try to break through the ice of this sixth grade uh, kid's emotional barriers to conversation. And he had been from home to home to home, uh, had been in abusive uh, situations, and was receiving this uh, after-school math tutoring care. And I'll never forget at the end of a, of a college semester, I was leaving for Christmas break and I said to Alan, hey, Alan, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going back to Texas um, for a few weeks and I, I'd like to see you again in January. And he looked up, it was the first time he engaged me with his eyes. It was the first time he said my name. And he said, Mr. Smedley, you're leaving? I, I, I didn't know that he had listened to anything for a semester. It, it was tragic. And I tried to explain the length of a, of a Christmas vacation and, and being away in Texas. And, and for him, it sounded and felt like forever. It broke my heart that he felt that way. I came back the next spring semester and, and, and went to be a part of this ministry. And the school had reassigned the ministry I was to be involved with to something else. And I just went to the office and said, look, you got, you got to let me go back and tutor Alan. And, uh, and they said, nope. Uh, procedures, procedures. So I doubled up and did two things and then went and spent the next semester with Alan. And then it was nonstop conversation. We got to talk about the gospel and those kinds of things. Uh, it, It was not any easier when he began to open up. In fact, it was harder. Because I either wanted to adopt this kid and have him all the time or never see him again. The, the thought of seeing him one hour on a Wednesday afternoon talking about math seemed so futile. And I don't, I don't know whatever became of Alan, but it, it provoked in my heart the desire to have something of a captive audience for evangelism and discipleship, um, which led to other kinds of ministries and student ministries in, in, in churches that involved uh, spending more time, intentional time uh, with young men. It also provoked in my heart a a strong desire to be a dad um, and and to have kids that couldn't leave, 
that you get 24 seven, um, that you could live a life before and that you could proclaim the gospel to. And that comes with its own challenges. And I know you know that it also uh, fostered in my own heart, a desire for adoption. I love the, the theology of adoption. And those of you who have pursued adoption, been adopted, um, adopted others, you understand the, the theology behind bringing someone into your home for love, selfless, sacrificial love. And, and the gospel embedded in the very idea of adoption is just a, a great way to do evangelism, adopt somebody. And some of you have done uh, what perhaps is the even harder task of fostering which you don't know the outcomes. You, you, you don't know how long you'll have this precious little captive audience. You don't know how much they'll understand, how much they'll hear. Uh, they may be out of your life, but you will pray for those foster kids for the rest of your earthly existence. And who knows how God may use that. So parenting, adopting, fostering, those are all ways that uh, people talk to me about this week of great ways to do evangelism. I heartily agree. We were talking as we left off last week, the content of evangelism. And we talked about a number of ways to, to tackle getting after the essentials of what must take place in an evangelistic conversation. And I want to boil down some of the bedrock fundamental content that must be there uh, to five points. Five points sounds very theological. Um, that's just coincidental. Um, typically, the, the, the formulaic outline that I've used for a lot of my life that I've heard taught and that I have taught had four points. Uh, I've become a five-pointer. Um, the four points are simply this, God, sin, the cross, and faith. Right? If you think about an outline to sort of hang the gospel on to make sure that as I'm communicating with somebody and I don't know what they believe, I don't know what they know and don't know, but I do want them to hear enough so that they could believe the saving gospel, be forgiven of their sins, and go to heaven. And, and so the, the first point that's often used in such a formulaic outline or framework is just the idea of God. God is big. God is holy. Uh, God demands perfect justice. He expects and rightfully deserves perfect obedience. And that's all well and fine until we get to the second point, which is the condition of man. Or we can bullet this point as sin. And we talk about the, the sinful nature of man, the corrupt nature of humanity cannot be perfect, cannot obey in a way that God demands. And so uh, there is an infinite breach between God, man's ability to please God and God's righteous demands. Those demands can only be met, of course, by point three in the framework outline, the cross work of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ came to pay for sins once and for all so that sinful man can be in the presence of a holy God. How does God qualify sinners to be in his presence? The cross work of Jesus Christ. That has to be explained. And then the fourth point in the outline is the faith repentance side of things. That's the response of the sinner. What must a sinner do in response to the cross? It's not enough that Christ died for sinners, the result of that that actually saves is that those sinners are brought to faith and repentance. And those are two sides of the same coin. You're turning from your former life, turning from idols, turning from everything else, and turning to God through Jesus Christ. To place your faith in Christ and his finished work is to turn from everything else to turn from self-sufficiency, from false religions, from idolatries, from love of any other competitors. And so those are typically the, the four points that are presented in an outline. And I would just add a fifth. And the fifth would be God. If we think about God, man, Christ, faith, and God. God would be the, the point at the end of the outline. And the reason I've sort of reframed that outline in my own mind is I'm talking with somebody, I like to have those hooks to hang something on to remember not to leave something important out. And that doesn't mean I'm going to get to a complete gospel conversation with somebody just because I got through my five points. We'll talk about the, the, the dangers of a formulaic approach in a moment. But I do want to remind myself that I have to talk about sin. If I haven't talked about sin, I'm not really going to get to the gospel. 
If I haven't talked about the cross work of Christ, I've, I've failed somewhere in explaining how sinners get saved. If I haven't talked about the holiness and the fundamental nature of God, I've missed something. And I would contend that if I don't talk about God at the end of the outline, I've probably missed something too. And it might very well be the good news of the good news. What is the good news of the gospel? Is it that you get your sins forgiven? Well, yes, that certainly is good news. A a burdened conscience now released from the burden. Uh, a, a, A filthy ledger now made a clean slate. Those are all good things. But they qualify us for something which is the good. Heaven is not a place where we walk around with our blank slates and look at each other and go, look, I've got a blank slate, you've got a blank slate, great. No more sin. No, the no more sin part of the gospel qualifies us to be in God's presence, to know Him, to have Him. Whom have I in heaven but you? And forgiveness of sin qualifies us to be in His presence. So don't leave out the good news of the good news. Don't leave out the best part, the, the promise of the Bible. God said, Isaiah 55, 1 to 3, everyone who comes to me, everyone who thirsts, come to me and get what you need without purchasing, without buying. I'm offering you the free gift of myself, God says. It's the invitation to delight in God. So that's the good news of the good news. We don't want to leave that out. So that's just kind of the framework I think about when I'm talking to somebody. I I, I don't know much about them, perhaps, and I'm thinking, God, man, Christ, faith and repentance, and God. Just as uh, framework hooks to hang truth on. But I would say this, don't be afraid of the whole Bible and the content beyond four or five gospel points. And we'll talk about this principle in in a few moments, but you don't know the heart, you don't know the situation, and and frankly, you and I can't know the sticking point at the heart level for somebody that's hearing the gospel from us. We don't know where where the idols are. We don't know where the, the prevailing sins are, the entangling things. And so sometimes reading off of the five points, reading anywhere else in the scriptures may be used of God to provoke conviction and to provoke a confidence in the greatness of God. And think about your own testimonies. We've heard some recently in in the waters of baptism. I got saved reading Leviticus. Um, I can't tell you how many times uh, I've heard in in a testimony, somebody said, somewhere in Romans, it happened. And it may not have been something that articulated one of the five hang on points that I just outlined. So don't be afraid of the whole Bible. Don't be afraid to go where people struggle and answer with God's word. Truth has a way of unearthing things in the heart that must be turned from. And someone can garner a conviction about lying on a passage that doesn't preach the gospel, but just exposes what lying is. And that one, having heard the gospel, perhaps in other forums, is pricked by a truth to run to Christ. So we know the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, it's able to pierce and to divide. So in gospel encounters, don't be afraid um, from an evangelistic motive to go to passages of scripture that are not precisely evangelistic. God loves to use his word. Okay, a few questions, and, and Tom Blevins brought up one of these uh, last week. I have a series here. What if I'm talking to someone who's smarter than me, and they turn to you and say, it's smarter than I? Oh, sorry. What if I'm talking to somebody who's drunk? Um, that's probably another story. Um, sometimes there's a time to move on. Um, sometimes there's a time to make sure somebody is in a right frame of mind. And it's not just about inebriation by alcohol. There are other frames of mind that can cause distortion for an ability to listen. Uh, There's a time to pray. There's a time to wait and have another conversation at another time. What if they're part of a world religion I don't know anything about? What if they're part of a cult and they use Bible verses? What if they ask a question that I don't know the answer to? Can God... Build an immovable lamppost and an unstoppable cannonball? And what happens when they collide? See, 
there's no God. I don't know what to say. What happens when you get stumped? What happens when you encounter somebody that knows things you don't know or, or can talk circles around you? Someone that can philosophize. Well, I just want to give you some confidence, Christian, that you know all you need to know in a very important sense. And you need to know something that's going on behind the scenes. If someone says, well, I don't believe the Bible, prove the Bible to me. You have to understand the reality of smoke screens. You know what a smoke screen is. Uh, somebody sets something on fire, distracts you with flames and smoke that, that hides the scene, and then they run away. There are theological, philosophical, intellectual smoke screens that people use as a defense mechanism against the intrusion of the gospel. And here you are, offering life and rescue from a terminal illness, an infinitely eternal terminal illness, as a free gift in God's grace. And they say, smoke bomb, run away, no thank you. Just recognize it for what it is. It's a distraction, and you know everything you need to know. If you've been forgiven of your sins by the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know everything that needs to be said in an argument. Think about John three nineteen to 21. Jesus' words there, you can look at it if you like. Jesus said, the judgment is this. Men loved darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. And so they don't come to the light because of what they want to practice. The, the reality is men are committed affectionately and therefore intellectually to darkness. Men loved it. Well, here comes the light of the gospel, and it's intruding on that darkness. And if you've ever picked up a rock in your backyard and seen the cockroaches scurry, where are they running to? More darkness. They like it. And you and I, when we were in the darkness, we liked the darkness, and we did not want the light coming in. It hurt our eyes. It hurt our senses. We put up all kinds of defenses we could, and we ran to another rock to hide underneath it. And when you're part of the darkness... You're enmeshed in the darkness, and you yet need to be rescued from the darkness. There's a part of you that loves the darkness and protects the darkness. And Jesus said in John 3 that God's indictment is already in place. This is the judgment. God has already assessed the reality of the situation. And Christian, evangelist, you need to remember it. God's already assessed it. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But I have a question you, know, you just said about um, you just made a comment. And it just, it, I, I like what you're saying, and it helps me understand. I, I had a question, now I'm all nervous. <laughs> <laughs> You're great. Go ahead. I actually, I, I didn't mention at the beginning, but we will have Q&A during this class. So you're A-OK -okay to ask your question. Tell me your name. Um, Beth. Beth. I'm so glad you're here, Beth. Do you guys have the handheld mic? I forgot to ask for it earlier. Um, Beth, go ahead and ask your question. I'll repeat it for the recording, and then I'll have the, the microphone ready for others, too. So you're in good company. Go ahead. Smoke screens, a commitment to darkness because they love it. Yeah. God, but God sees everything, hears everything, um, he's, he knows it all, he's in the darkness too, so, but we think we're hiding, we're not. Yeah, Beth, thank you, that is so insightful, um, Jeremiah 17 tells us that God sees everything even to the heart, and that one day God will disclose even the thoughts and the motives that we hide from other people. You're exactly right. God sees everything. Um, yeah, there, so hiding from God is something we feel like we're doing. Um, and, and it doesn't actually work. God sees it all. 
And, and what's so fantastic is when, when someone steps into someone else's life and says, God has rescued me from darkness. Can I tell you how? And, and, a, and a Christian offers life and light and joy and everything and God himself to the one listening. And, and that's exactly how people get rescued from darkness. Uh, thank you, Beth, for bringing that up. That is fantastic. And think about what um, an unbeliever knows. There's some things that, that you have when you're preaching the gospel, when you're sharing the gospel, when you're pleading with somebody to, to turn from their sin and to love Christ. Think about the allies that you have in the world and in the heart of the one still trapped in darkness. Okay, let's think on the outside, first of all. Uh, this is Psalm 19 and Romans 1. Psalm 19 says, the heavens are screaming out the glory of God. Right? Anybody can go outside and look around and say, wow, this is here, it's been designed, somebody built this. And, and we also know from Romans 1 that people take that truth and they suppress it, again, because they don't want the, the light to invade the darkness. But everybody knows that God created everything. And Romans 1 goes on further to tell us that God has placed the knowledge of himself inside every human heart. Although they knew God, this is the truth of, of Romans 1. Uh, the, everybody, everybody that has ever lived, while not knowing God savingly, has known God in the sense of an awareness that God exists. Both from the evidence that is external, but also because God has implanted the knowledge in the human heart. Furthermore, according to Romans 2, God has planted in the human heart a knowledge of right and wrong. Everybody has a category of right and wrong. Everybody has a moral compass. It can be rewritten. It can be reprogrammed. Uh, you can decide one day that something's right and something else is wrong, and the next day that something else is wrong and something is right. But the very categories of right and wrong are embedded in the human heart by God as a witness that God exists and he holds accountable every human being. So what that means when you're sharing the gospel with somebody, you know that they know that God exists and they may or may not be suppressing that truth. And you know that they know that there are categories of right and wrong. And sometimes it shows up on Mill Avenue when you're talking about the gospel to somebody and you're speaking about objective truth on a Thursday night over by ASU. And somebody says, how dare you tell me this or that is right or wrong? You can't believe in objective truth. There is no objective truth. And that by itself is an objective truth statement and a moral demand that we not say it. <laughs> they're demonstrating the very truth that they're denying. And so what that means for you is you don't have to win the argument, Christian. God has already made the argument in the universe. And he has placed the argument embedded in the human heart. And he's already pricked the person you're talking to at the conscience level with a knowledge that there are categories of right and wrong. So you have tremendous allies. You don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You don't have to outsmart the smarty pants philosopher on the street. What do you do? Just declare the gospel. And particularly the gospel as it has invaded your own life is a wonderful strategy. If you've been forgiven and you know how, then you have what every unsaved person desperately needs, whether they realize it or not. If you find yourself talking to uh, a Mormon who uses Bible verses, what do you know about that person who is denying the gospel? They don't have forgiveness of sin. They don't have a guarantee. That they don't know that they're going to heaven. And when you press them and you ask them, so are you going to heaven? They'll say, oh, I hope so. I think so. Well, the Bible says you can know so if you will place your faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work. Let me tell you about it. You already know, Christian, everything you need to know to faithfully proclaim the gospel. So don't be intimidated by smoke screens. You have all the information that every sinner desperately needs. Your task is simply to dispense it. So let me lay out some principles for evangelism for you this morning. Um, principles for evangelism. These are in no particular order. But I would start with this. Don't forget your theology. Don't forget your theology as you're doing evangelism. And what I mean by that is, don't forget what man is. Let's think anthropology for a moment. Man is a creature created in the image of God and fallen. Man sins by nature 
out of his own nature, sins and offends the holiness of God in his actions and attitudes and deeds and words. And because of that, man can't help himself. Man has no ability to rescue himself with his own resources from the plight that he's in. This is why Ephesians 2.1 says, And we were dead in our transgressions and sins, in which we used to walk. Uh, we, we were walking around in a spiritual deadness. And that deadness means inability. Inability to rescue self from the predicament we're in. Sinners by nature, sinners by activity out of that nature, and dead in those sins. Unable to extricate ourselves from our plight. We needed rescue. Just like we talked about last week with Air Florida Flight 90 and Priscilla Torado in the water. She can't even muster up the strength to grip the rope to be rescued. Lenny Skutnik jumped in and pulled her out himself. She was hopeless and helpless and would be dead. And she was rescued. Salvation is a rescue by God where he, Ephesians 2.5, makes alive that which was spiritually dead. When you think about anthropology correctly, then you know what must happen. Somebody, God, must speak life. Just as God spoke light into existence... He also speaks the light of the gospel into the heart of the unbelieving, the ones blinded by Satan and trapped in their own sins. He he speaks light into that life so that belief happens. So Christian, that has radical implications for our evangelism. We don't work the, the natural abilities of man to try to get him into making a decision about Christ. We don't appeal to his natural faculties. His natural faculties are tainted, corrupted. We don't appeal to his philosophizing, to engage with the philosophizing, so that on his philosophizing ground, he can judge whether or not God is right for him. No, the reality is, he must be acceptable before God. Not God made acceptable to him. Well, this means we do not change the message to suit the man. The man is dead and needs life. And guess what happens when you preach the gospel and someone believes? Everyone in this room who is a believer has experienced already the transformation from death unto life just as Lazarus walked out of the tomb when Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. That which was dead, unresponsive, unable, responded. Where was the power? In Lazarus' natural faculties and abilities, the power was in the word of Jesus to make him alive. And don't forget your theology. Don't forget your theology proper. That is what we believe about God. He is sovereign. He is in charge. And he seeks worshipers. Matthew 4, remember Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well. The father seeks worshipers. The Father is the one who makes us alive, Ephesians 2.5. God actually goes about the business of saving people, of doing the impossible. And salvation is just that. It is impossible. We don't forget our soteriology. That is the doctrine of salvation. It is the work of God. God is the one who foreknows, predestines, calls, justifies, glorifies. And He is the one who uses means. How does he bring about the salvation of one whom he's foreknown, that is, foreloved before time began and predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ? Does that make the evangelist sit on their heels and say, well, if God is sovereign and election is biblical, we'll just wait and see what happens? Listen to Paul, 2 Timothy 2.10. I endure all things for the sake of the elect so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. There is a remarkable relationship between God's sovereign work and salvation and the means he sovereignly uses to bring salvation about. Beautiful are the feet that bring good news. Romans 10. 
And think about the people that brought the gospel into your life, patiently prayed for you, labored over you in word, brought you to church, gave you a Bible, left a tract in a public place. (laughs) Whatever it was, God was sovereignly orchestrating your coming to faith in Christ and he was doing it through means. And so Paul labors and strives at being a means of God's sovereign use. Sure, it would be nice if there was an elect tattoo. You know, you get a little black light at Home Depot and scan it. Okay, E. Okay, I'll preach the gospel to you now. No, we get no such thing. How do we find whom God is saving? I think we indiscriminately preach the gospel to everything that moves and see who believes. Dimitri was way smarter than I. Me, I. He was a double major at a Russian university living in a dorm. Nuclear physics and something else, some sort of engineering. Uh, He was fluent in English, perhaps better at English than I am. And of course, in Russian, really smart college student. He was an atheist, or he said he was. He said, for 70 years, our country has known that there is no God, and so we know that. By the way, could God build a rock so big that he couldn't move it? That was his proof. That was his conscience salve. So I thought, well, I know that's a smokescreen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull a Ro- uh, Romans 1 and Psalm 19 on him. So I went over to his dorm room window and flung open the curtain. I didn't know it was on the other side. You know, I expected some marvelous scene of creation. You know, a nice Arizona sunset with the the, the orange sky and the purple mountains. That would have been fantastic. Some mighty thunderstorm to to scare him into into repentance. You know, nothing like that. It, It was the dray grab wall of a communist dorm building in front of a gray sky. And in between uh, his window and that other dorm building was a dead tree and its dead limb stretched across the front of the window. Oh, great. This illustration's blown. And I opened the window. I said, who made this? (laughs) And then I looked out the window. And he sighed. He said, oh. Well, of course God made that, but if I admit it, I have to stop sleeping with my girlfriend and drinking vodka all the time. It's literally what he said. And then I took him to Romans 1 and talked about truth suppression and said, yes, God has placed in your heart the knowledge that he exists. And he said, I know. And that there's right and wrong. Yep. And that you're going to be accountable for it. Yes. Da. That was, that was uh, surprising to me in so many ways. It changed my evangelism from that point forward. Uh, in America, I, I was less, I've been less likely to fall for the smokescreen. And somebody claims to be an atheist, I'm, I'm more likely to say, no, you're not. God told me you're not. <laughs> and eventually what happens in a conversation with a self-professed atheist who would have to be everywhere all the time, to prove that there were no God. It's an untenable position intellectually. And eventually, a thinking person would have to admit that. They usually resort to agnostic. Well, I'm agnostic. Agnostic is, it comes from the Greek word for agnosis. We get our words ignorant and ignoramus. The idea is I'm, I'm choosing not to know. Well, let me tell you what you're choosing not to know. You're choosing not to know what you do know. The knowledge that God has implanted in your heart that he exists. The knowledge that there's right and wrong, which you've already proven to me by telling me that I shouldn't be telling you these things. And the knowledge that you'll be accountable for these very things. Listen, Christian, you you, you don't have to parrot the conversation I had with Dimitri. You just need to know what a Dimitri is. He's a sinner in need of a savior. And Jesus Christ can break through. Proclaim the gospel. Tell what God has done for you. I I love the story of Augustine. And and really, I love the story of Augustine's mother, Monica. Uh, She had prayed for her son for 30 years. 
And, and it wasn't her pleas in the end that, that broke him. He, he was away from home, living a profligate life, successful as far as the world goes and immoral, following in his father's footsteps. And this broken-hearted mother who had prayed for him for decades later discovered that he was walking down a city street and heard a little kid singing a ditty about the Bible. Take up the book and read. Something like our B-I-B-L-E. And he was convicted. Pick up the book of Romans. And somewhere in Romans, God saved him. We don't need the sophisticated answers. We need to know that God is sovereign over salvation and that men are dead and they need something that is humanly impossible. They need supernatural intervention by the power of the Holy Spirit to raise the dead. Second principle is don't forget where the power is. Look at Romans 1.16. Don't forget where the power is. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also, in, and also to the Greek. Why is the gospel the power of God for salvation? Verse 17, because in the gospel and in the gospel alone is the righteousness of God. Why do I need the righteousness of God? Verse 18 and following, because the wrath of God. Wrath is coming, wrath abides, you need righteousness. Where are you going to find righteousness? Only in the gospel, therefore, the gospel is the power of salvation. And we need to be careful not to misplace the power, uh, to assume the gospel needs help. How can I make a platform for the gospel? We sometimes here. Or I need a bridge to get to the gospel or to, to make the gospel uh, understandable or even believable, that some strategy is the key. And oftentimes when we put confidence in a strategy, a bridge or a platform, we are actually taking away from the gospel the power inherent in the gospel to save. I remember a prominent pastor uh, from a couple decades ago, uh, said at a college chapel I was at that he, give him enough time, he could find the key to any human heart. And he preached a, a sermon on evangelism. It, it, the outline was the acronym SALT. But his, his point was, you have to tap into the felt need of any individual. And once you find that need that that person feels most acutely, and you turn that key they will surrender to Christ. And, and you've just induced a human solution to a human felt problem. Never mind the real problem. Man's sin before a holy God. Now, the power is not in our ability to find the certain key. The power is in the gospel itself, clearly proclaimed. Third principle, don't misdefine success in evangelism. Uh, success is not going to be found in numbers. Frankly, success is found in the heralding. Gospel proclamation is heralding. That is, we have the king's message and we proclaim it. Unadulterated, unfiltered. And success is when we honor him and we represent our savior. And we do, those in, we do that in a variety of ways, depending on the, the, the people we're around, and, and we love people. But the task is proclaim Christ. The results are in his hands. That goes along with our anthropology, soteriology, and theology proper. The results are in his hands. So what does it mean to be a successful evangelist? It means to proclaim before a lost and dying world the riches of the excellencies of Christ. And do you know he is honored when you do it? Every failed gospel proclamation is worship. Look, if, if you and I didn't cry out how wonderful Jesus is, the rocks surely would. So cry out. No matter the response, it doesn't matter who hears or who heeds. We certainly do so because we want people to be saved. But fundamentally, our evangelism is doxological. So friend, don't be discouraged when you proclaim the gospel and somebody doesn't believe. Be reminded how many times you didn't believe when you heard the gospel or read the gospel. God is patient. 
I love the, the scene in, in the book of Revelation. It happens a couple of times where the prayers of the saints are in a golden bowl before the altar of God. What does that mean? Prayers prayed by believers are precious to the Lord. I think you could make a case for the similarity of evangelistic proclamation. If done for love of Christ and love for sinners that reflects the heart of God and glorifies God and honors him even in the throne room of heaven. A fourth principle about evangelism, pray. Pray. Pray for people. Pray in the evangelistic encounter. Your brain can do two things at once. (laughs) You can be speaking and praying simultaneously, uttering expressions of dependence upon the Lord. Prayer boiled down to its basic is simply help. Lord, help. I need you. I'm dependent upon you. Pray. Pray for opportunities. Pray in the midst of opportunities, pray for boldness, pray for courage, pray for one another. There are a lot of ways that prayer holds hands with evangelism. But remember how critical prayer is. People we're sharing the gospel with are at enmity with God. God's wrath abides and they are shaking their fist at God in some form or fashion. What will break that down? (laughs) Remember that they're enslaved to sin. Romans 5, the end of Romans 5 tells us that they are under the dominion of sin until Romans 6, and they are set free from slavery to sin. To be enslaved to sin means something supernatural must break those chains. Blinded by Satan, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Spiritually dead, Ephesians 2. And remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, we plant and we water, but God causes the growth. So pray. Pray that God would do what only God can do. A fifth principle, recognize our limitations. We don't see the heart. We don't know what the idols are. Don't assume that someone acquiescing to a gospel presentation is believing. Uh, Praying the prayer at the the end of 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 a come forward and talk to a counselor at a concert does not mean conversion. And and I know this painfully. I, I have led a number of high school friends to say a prayer, to pray a prayer, to make a decision, and to sign a card who are not walking with the Lord today. Uh, the, the goal here is not necessarily to, to seal the deal, to get somebody to make the decision, but the goal is to aim to be clear enough that an unbeliever could reject what you're saying if what you're saying is the truth of the gospel. It means that the rich young ruler would walk away from a gracious encounter with Christ when he realized the cost of following Christ was too high for him. And and of course, that was a a bad deal. Uh, That was a bad gamble on his part. He he thought his uh, little pile of rubbish could compare to the infinite riches of knowing the Savior that stood in front of him. But don't assume that someone having a pleasant conversation with you and agreeing with the facts and points of the gospel has just been converted. Perhaps they have. Um, but, but there is uh, an unfolding of competitors to the gospel. Weeds, thorns, sun that scorches, Satan that plucks seed off of a hard road. How do you know? Well, don't give up preaching the gospel. Don't give up putting the word of God in front of somebody. Don't assume that acquiescence equals conversion. By the way, so often people can use the same words and mean radically different things. Just be aware of that. Somebody can say, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins and have no idea what they're talking about. There could be untouched idols, the cost of discipleship, repentance and faith not in place. Number six, remember that conversion is not the end goal of evangelism. Disciple making is. You know, the goal is not to get as many people with a get out of hell free card as possible in a short period of time, but to make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded. That is the path. Principle number seven, we appeal to the will, 2 Corinthians 5.21, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God, but we do not manipulate the will. 
We do not look for strategies and tactics that will bend and yield the will to our clever conversation. But we appeal to the will. Listen, God doesn't save somebody around their will. He fundamentally alters it. He changes the heart. And by the way, unbelievers are obligated to believe. They must. They're obligated by command to be born again. They're obligated to turn from sin and turn to Christ. We appeal to those obligations from heaven. But we recognize that to manipulate the will, to come up with schemes and strategies to get somebody to just yield to us, either so we'll stop talking at them, or for some other reason, um, is actually um, undermines biblical evangelism. All right, we'll take um, someday in a future equipping hour, we'll look at an example of evangelism from Acts 26. And we'll look at some varieties of New Testament evangelistic expression. But we'll take the last 13 minutes this morning to uh, just ask some questions uh, about evangelism. What's on your mind? What would you like to discuss? Steve, there's a microphone coming and everything you say can and will be used against you. It will be recorded. Thanks, Matt. Uh, you just said that um, the goal is not to, um, I'm going to try and put words in your mouth, uh, hopefully you said, um, the goal is not to get them, make sure that they make a decision, the, the right decision. Um, I'm, I'm misquoting you. Uh, conversion's not the end goal. Disciple making is the end goal. And um, getting somebody to make a decision in an evangelistic encounter can be misleading. Is it necessary to drive them to being confronted with a decision? Yeah, I, you know what? I, I've kind of gone both ways on that. I, I think what Steve's asking, and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, um, should we press for a decision? Is that what you're asking? Um, yes, in one sense, they're obligated to be born again. You must be born again. <laughs> How long are you going to go down the road of wickedness when life is before you? You need to turn to Christ. I, I, I have no problem pressing for that. Um, so are you going to do it now? How about now? How about now? I'm not sure I want to go that far with the pressing for the decision. I don't know if that distinction makes sense. Um, we, we, we do appeal to the will. We press for the obligation. But I'm not so concerned that right now in this encounter, I've got to seal the deal if I'm going to be the faithful evangelist. Some have said you must. And, and I would disagree with that. I think you can prompt spurious conversions by an act of the will rather than seeing a genuine conversion. I think there's a danger in it. Follow-up question. Your wheels are turning. That's a good question. Um, I, you Probably personality by personality would see that differently. I don't mind, and I'll steal a, a, a phrase from, from another. I don't mind putting a rock in the shoe of somebody. I don't feel like I have to have the whole conversation right now in one fell swoop. I have uh, run the scenario in my mind, if the plane was going down, how long would it take me to uh, unbuckle my seatbelt, run to the front where the flight attendant has a little microphone, and hold down the, the mic? Um, and, if, and if it was 60 seconds to the ground, and, and I spent 45 seconds on depravity and 15 seconds on, 14 seconds on Christ, and say, repent, <laughs> you know? Um, I, I run that scenario. Th there are places where I want to get to the end of the conversation and make sure the gospel was clear. But I don't have that as a conviction of, of how every conversation must go. I, I actually like the idea of making somebody uncomfortable with some biblical truth, especially somebody that I have some repeat interaction with. If it's someone that I'm, I'm passing, probably this is the only time I meet them on this earth in this life, I feel more compelled to say as much as I can. Um, but I, I, I like the idea of trusting the Lord, putting this truth in here, letting that settle, um, because the, the things of the heart are, are deep. God can save in a moment. God can save over the process of conversations. So I'm kind of a both and.
Thanks, Eric. Matt's coming. You too are accountable for your words. <laughs> Eric Comperini. You spoke about um, not, not really taking it as a true conversion, the fact that someone acquiesced of uh, the gospel. Uh, can you elaborate that a little more in light of Romans 10, 9, and 10? That yep. speaks of uh, confessing. Yep, that's great. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 10. This is a, a classic text that's often used um, as an explanation of evangelism that boils evangelism simply down to something happened in my heart and then I said something out loud. I believed and I confessed. Um, and, and in a, a formulaic uh, kind of um, uh, crusade, uh, city crusade type of evangelist encounter, big tent revival, bring all your friends, we're going to get an evangelist, preach the gospel, and all Christians come and be counselors, meet people down at front, and, and walk them through these things. Romans 10, 9, and 10 becomes sort of the banner verse. Um, and, and listen, what you need to do is believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Um, and I want to walk through Romans 10, 9, and 10 in a little more detail to, to dispel the notion of the, the apparent simplicity of that formula. Um, but before we get there, I just want to, we just need to recognize the reality that there are different kinds of soils. Jesus described that. John just preached through this in Mark. And there are people that respond who are not regenerate. So I'm just a little bit leery of pushing for the immediate response and ticking off the, hey, we got two today. By the way, I personally am two of the statistics for the Billy Graham crusade. I walked forward twice, met with a counselor, prayed the prayer, signed the card. Neither of those was a regeneration experience. So I'm just, I'm leery of the, the statistics and pushing it that way. So Romans 10, 9, and 10 is important. You got to go back up to verse 5. Really, actually, sorry, you got to go back to Romans 1.1 1, 1 and walk all the way through the whole book. We'll pick it up in 10.5. Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Don't say in your heart, here's Deuteronomy 9, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? Deuteronomy 30. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. Um, a righteousness based on faith. That's the theme of the book of Romans. The righteousness of faith. It doesn't say, how can I go up and get a Messiah for myself? And how can I accomplish the saving work of that Messiah by raising him from the dead? Saving faith doesn't say any of those things. That's arrogant and audacious. That is self-righteousness, law righteousness. What does faith righteousness say instead? Verse 8. The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. This is the same Old Testament, New Testament. That, what is the content of this? That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and you believe in your heart that, and here's the emphasis, God raised him from the dead. If you underline something in your Bible for emphasis, you should probably underline the word God there in verse 9. Because God raising him from the dead is a contrast to you raising Jesus from the dead in verse 7. A self-righteous man says, I can do what, it, what needs to happen to, to be saved. Even if it means raising a Messiah from the dead, I can do that. <laughs> no, verse 9. Believe in your heart that God did the work from beginning to end. Sent a Messiah crushed the Messiah, and raised him from the dead. God did the work from beginning to end. You believe that, and you will be saved, and there's no disappointment. The, the issue is not a two-step program. Believe in your heart, then confess with your mouth, and you're saved. Boom, boom. Uh, that's external. That's, that's man's stuff. That's procedural. That's not salvation. Now, there is belief in the heart that has to happen, and there is confession with the mouth that has to happen, but the content of what's believed... And the, and the life going along with the confession of what's confessed, that Jesus is Lord, he's my master, that implies surrender. What's at stake in Romans 2, 9, and 10? Abandon, abandonment of self-righteousness and abandonment of self-rule. You find somebody at the, at the end of a, of, a, of a crusade comes down for counseling and says, I'm done with myself. I don't want to be in charge anymore. And I believe that God, everything, God did everything is required for salvation. 
Now you're talking Romans 10, 9, and 10. Does that make sense? We're, I think we're too quick to get a confession that supposedly reveals belief. You can have sincerity and people be sincerely wrong. Right? But the content's critical. That's a great question. Thanks, Eric. What else? We've got four minutes. Matt, I see that hand. Good morning. Okay, tell me your name. Yep. Hi there. Good morning. Daniel Acosta. Uh, yep. We're visiting from Sun uh, Valley Grace uh, okay. in Los Angeles. We always appreciate your preaching, and mm. uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Smedley. Just a quick question about resources. Uh, do you have any particular Bible tracks that you would recommend looking at uh, that we might have on hand for quick moments where we can hand off something? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I have a kind of a museum collection of tracks that I've used over the years. Um, they all work and none of them work simultaneously. Uh, God does the work. We, we have printed some in-house. You're welcome to, to stop by the info table. We'll get some out there for you. So come see the ones that we have offhand. I, I, don't, I don't remember which ones I like the best. Um, I've kind of moved away from uh, using tracks just personally, although I think it's great. Um, find a good one that doesn't confuse theologically. Um, and I like, what I like about our tracks is it, is it um, includes information about the local church so that people can come and see trophies of grace assembled and gathered and living out the Christian life. So that's important. Um, by the way, say hi to all our friends uh, back there when you get home in Sun Valley. Thank you. Oh, and uh, re- you mentioned resources. I would say um, Packer's book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, was one that I, I would have recommended if I'd gotten through the notes here today. So um, you can write that down. Um, that has been an elder-recommended resource in the past. We'll probably do it again sometime. Uh, was there another question over here? Diana. Okay, di- say it out loud and I'll repeat it. Um, certain denominational yeah. cults tend to do that, and do we let them in, or do we do the second John? Don't receive them into your house. Thank you. You beat me yeah. to the punch. Yeah, um, I, I don't invite them in anymore because of Second John. Um, you're talking about someone who is uh, going around and clearly teaching a false gospel, um, and so this this prohibition. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. The one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Um, there's probably something a little more robust than a uh, door entryway. Hey, come in. Is he in or is he out? You know, where does the roof line end? Something a little bit bigger about the hospitality at stake there and housing and participating in the support of traveling itinerant heretics. Um, but I personally apply that principle to JWs and Mormons at the door. Um, and, and I haven't always, um, but um, the last couple, maybe decade and a half, I, I think I have. <clears throat> and so um, that's different for me than a Mormon neighbor, Mormon friend. I have a different relationship. But somebody who's on the clock, on the job, going around, I, I don't invite him in for that reason. Okay. Steve, did you have a 30 second follow up? There was one other. Who else? Okay. Carol. If there's a like non believer who, well, not a th- somebody who believes that they are a believer um, and they're like challenging, but they're challenging like specific doctrines. Um, and, you know, revealing that they have hardness of heart towards the gospel in general. Like, do you have, what do you say, go back to the roots of the gospel and, like, reestablish the fundamentals that actually can bring them to salvation? Or, like, are you, is it wise, I suppose, to, like, actually address the specific theological points if they, they're, like, trying to use it as a cover-up? Okay, that's a great question, Carol. And, and there's really not one answer to that. I don't have one response that I do. And, and you're talking about a spectrum of people um, depending on the, the issue and the situation. But I, I love opening my Bible with anybody who's willing to talk. And, and 
If I, if I am suspicious they don't understand the gospel, then I, I want to take my Bible down gospel paths with them. And I love letting the other person read the text and we have a conversation like, hey, what does this text say? How do you take this? What does God mean by it? Um, how does this address the question that you have in mind? Um, and there are sneaky ways to, to address a specific question somebody's asking from a text that gets at a gospel issue. Um, and I like to do that. Um, but if someone is a believer and is hard-hearted towards specific doctrines, let's open the Bible together. Let's let God's word be the authority. This isn't my idea against yours. God wins. And the same principles apply. Um, I'm a herald of God's truth. Um, we can trust it. It's powerful. Um, and so whether they're a believer or not a believer, I think the same thing. The issue really is bibliological. Um, what do you think about God's word? Well, I don't, I don't believe God's word. I think it was written by men. Okay, we'll just read it. And you know what? The, this word you think is written by men is actually powerful to overcome that notion. Just read it. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your kindness to us in saving us. Thank you for using bold, courageous, uh, timid and afraid, um, and yet bold and courageous people to tell us the gospel, to be heralds of your grace in our lives. Uh, we pray that the chain would not be broken and that we would return the favor and be eager to pray for opportunities, look for opportunities, and take those opportunities as you provide them to tell about your excellencies. We pray that it would be our business on this earth for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.